Hi, uh, I'm Ross McKittrick. A uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to go through some cost-benefit analysis methods that the EPA and the Department of Energy use to justify new regulations. Um, the one point that I'm going to make is that they mistakenly treat a large category of costs as if they were benefits. And fixing that error alone would justify the repeal, as I'll show, of regulations that have cost hundreds of billions of dollars. Now to explain it, I need you to understand a simple economic concept, so I'm going to illustrate it with an example. Suppose there are only two types of wine in the world. There's one that costs $10 a bottle, and there's one that costs $50 a bottle. And the second one, because it's more expensive, we only sell 1,000 bottles per year. So there's a $40 price difference between them. Now, the U.S. Department of Wine Regulation fortunately does not exist, but if it did, here's what they would say. Wine B costs $40 more per bottle than wine A, but our engineers can't taste the difference. And both bottles have the same amount of wine in them, so we're going to ban bottle B. And when you ask why are they going to do that, the reasoning is we will save customers $40,000 a year. They're not allowed to buy the $50 bottle anymore. They can buy the $10 bottle. Each time they save $40 a bottle. So that means we've just saved consumers $40,000 a year. You're welcome. Now, here's the problem. They're misinterpreting what that $40 represents. This is not money being wasted by irrational consumers. It's a measurement of what some consumers are willing to pay for what they perceive to be a higher quality product. So in other words, it's a measure of a benefit to the consumer, not a cost of making an irrational decision. It's the subjective preference of the consumer, but it's still the consumer's own decision. It represents a benefit to that consumer of a better wine. Now in economics, we call that consumer surplus. The $40 is actually a lower bound. Presumably, for each consumer, uh, they're willing to pay $40 or more to get the better wine. So the consumer surplus for any one person may be much more than 40, but it won't be less than 40. By treating that as a cost, the bureaucrats are saying they're smarter than you. They know your preferences better than you. They know what you need better than you know yourself. And you're just being irrational. So by correcting your irrationality, we're going to save you money. So here's how it plays out in a more practical example. We have two light bulbs here. Compact fluorescent bulb, which in my example might use $5 per year of electricity, and an incandescent bulb, which might use $10 a year of electricity. And we'll say there's a billion of these bulbs in use. <clears throat> So what the experts in the government will say, another department which fortunately doesn't exist, but there's another government that does, another department that does exist um, that will say the same thing. The incandescent bulb costs $5 more per year than the compact fluorescent, but they both give the same amount of light. So we're going to ban the incandescent bulb, and this will save consumers $5 billion a year. You're welcome. <coughs> now. It's the same problem here. That $5 represents someone's willingness to pay for a better quality of light. Now, it might be that the engineers in the Department of Energy or wherever made this decision can't tell or don't care about the difference in the quality of light, but it's, it's not their decision to make. That $5 is a measure of what people are willing to pay to get the quality of light from an incandescent bulb as opposed to a CFL bulb. So it's a measure of the benefit of the availability of the product, not a cost of an irrational mistake that consumers are making. So by banning the better product, they're actually imposing a cost on consumers, namely the loss of consumer surplus. You're forcing people to use a product they don't want, and it's a loss of consumer surplus as a result. Okay. So, there's a secondary issue here that I'm not going to go into, but that $5 estimate is almost certainly an overestimate. There is a lot of empirical research, um, quite a few papers just coming out over the past year or so, that shows that these estimates from government agencies are grossly overstating the potential savings um, that, uh, and 
the five dollars may not exist in practice, but if, it, if any savings exists, it's less than what the engineers in government have been saying. But I'm going to focus on this loss of consumer surplus. So here's an example using the EPA cost-benefit analysis from the CAFE rule for the 2011. These are numbers taken from the Federal Register. So on the cost side, uh, in order to impose the higher fuel economy standards, it'll cost $140 uh, billion dollars just to change over the vehicle fleet. There's an extra cost due to more hazardous accidents because people are in smaller cars. So that's $192 billion in costs. On the benefit side, actually not very big. The environmental improvements, which are probably overstated, but just taking the numbers they gave, $54.4 billion, something to do with energy security, $24.2 billion. Total benefits here of $78.6 billion. But now we're going to add in the consumer benefits of $534 billion. We're going to force you to drive smaller cars so you're going to uh, use less gas. And we're going to correct your irrationality and that gives us this huge increase in the benefits column. So now we have total benefits $613.6 billion compared to cost of $192 billion so the rule can be justified. And uh, and it went through on that basis. So here's the problem though. Those consumer benefits, that's actually a loss of consumer surplus. They've miscategorized this loss. People are willing to pay more for fuel to drive the larger vehicles because they want the quality and the features of the larger vehicles. So that's an estimate of the consumer surplus associated with the larger vehicles. So it belongs over here on the cost side. And if we do the tallies correctly, we have total costs of $726 billion against benefits of $78.6 billion. And so obviously this rule should never have been approved. Um, this was a study by Ted Geyer and Kip Viscusi a few years ago in the Journal of Regulatory Economics, uh, tallying up what are the benefits from the energy efficiency regulations, uh, and this is again with CAFE rule uh, standards, that big blue pie shape, the 87% of the benefits cited, these are, and the, the, the diagram itself labels it correctly, these are benefits from correcting consumer irrationality. Most of the benefits that the EPA is able to point to amount to them saying, we know better than you and we're going to correct your irrational decisions. The greenhouse gas benefits are a tiny little sliver. Even the, um, uh, the, the benefits from uh, health benefits from reduced air pollution, they're almost certainly exaggerated, but that's still a tiny sliver. The benefits from correcting consumer irrationality, that's where all their uh, the justification comes from. And as I say, it's a fundamental misinterpretation of what those numbers mean. Those are costs not benefits. So, second example, the CAFE standards for heavy duty trucks. Uh, the basic costs and benefits would be reversed here. The costs that the EPA says are 9.6 billion should have been 60 billion. Benefits of 58.9 billion should have been 8.4 billion. And uh, that rule should not have gone through. Furnace fan regulations. For some reason, you need to be told what kind of furnace fan you should buy. Uh, using the 3% discount case, the Department of Energy says benefits of them telling you what kind of furnace fan to buy are $43.8 billion, costs $5.8 billion. But if you correctly interpret the fact that people might want a more powerful furnace fan and are willing to pay extra for the electricity to run it, then the corrected costs would be 37.8 billion, the benefits would be 11.8 billion. Now, I'll just back up a step here. <clears throat> All I've done in this case is take some elementary economic reasoning that should have been applied in the first place in these cost benefit analyses. I haven't talked about discount rates or, or anything complicated. This is just understanding the concept of consumer surplus and doing away with the paternalistic approach with the regulatory agency where they assume that you're all irrational and we will correct your irrational decision making by banning options that we don't think you should buy. 
if you reject that and take the non-paternalistic and much more sensible approach of saying people are willing to pay more for more powerful furnace fans because it represents an actual benefit to them as the owner. Um, just make that one correction and then go through the whole list of regulations over the past decade and you'll see uh, they don't just fail the cost-benefit analysis, they fail it by a mile. It's not even close. Okay, there are further issues that I haven't touched on here um, and they all work in the same direction. So I mentioned overestimated effectiveness of energy efficiency policies and rules. Um, uh, there are, uh, there's a long-standing puzzle in the energy efficiency literature. It's not really a puzzle, but they think it's a puzzle that there are all these great energy efficiency technologies that people could buy that households are strangely reluctant to, to adopt. And so uh, it's on this basis that a lot of engineering studies say, well, we're just going to have to force people to do it. They're not going to do it on their own, so we'll force people to do it. And that's happened over the years. But now the data is available to start estimating, well, okay, how much did people actually save from like the weatherization assistance program it was a big, very expensive program to force people uh, to insulate their homes differently. Not surprisingly, it turned out that the benefits to those households was minuscule, that they didn't save nearly as much as the engineers in the Department of Energy thought they would. The models that the engineers used just overestimated the benefits. <laughs> Overstated benefits of environmental improvements. There's been some great work done by Stan Young sitting right there uh, and co-authors showing that the health effects of air pollution regulations are not what they've been cracked up to be. That uh, the, the mortality benefit from uh, particulate reductions is, uh, is a very tiny noisy signal and um, government scientists have been uh, overstating it for a long time. Uh, Kevin talked about the social cost of carbon uh, based on a too high climate sensitivity. Um, also, uh, the, the EPA is now under fire for including the entire world benefits in the social cost of carbon uh, rather than the domestic benefits. Those are all important issues. They need to be addressed they, uh, and they all are being addressed. Uh, one thing to stress is Anytime those methodologies are tweaked in a certain direction, they've always gone in the direction of justifying more regulation. But I want to suggest the big one here is all these agencies treat lost consumer surplus as if that was a benefit. It should be treated as a cost. Properly classifying it as a cost would overturn cost-benefit regulations. Just on the examples I've given you, uh, that would add up to about three quarters of a trillion dollars worth of regulations and I'm sure there are more in the books that could be found. And um, so I think that's the only point I want to make. Thank you.